memory is a care-based practice. We, we cobble together things that already have meaning, you know? If we have certain tools that allow us to kind of really create memory or preserve practices or preserve um, lived experience, that we should really be kind of tapping into that. Also, as a white male in America, I need to be in a listening mode. Uh, I need to shut my mouth and, and listen. Hi, and welcome to the Porto Design Biennale. My name is André Cruz. You are listening to Voices from the Atelier, a series of six podcasts, each dedicated to one alter reality. Truth, dignity, play, memory, dream, and language. This is episode five, and we're going through memory in design. Memory is directly linked to imagination. We are shaped by the memory of ancient practices, habits, and modes of living. Design is based on memories, whether visual, physical, ethnographic, or cultural. It has been an important tool in the assertion of identities, but also we must not ignore the role that design has played in sustaining civilizational models where justice is anything but blind. Focusing on memory, an important aspect of design, I invited for this podcast the designer and professor Paul Sarr, and also cultural researcher, designer, and editor of Dean Journal, Alice Grandois. Good listening. It's very common to see designers, generally speaking, doing monographs. Based on his book, Two-Dimensional Man, a graphic memoir, I asked Pulsar what made him go for this unusual but far more revealing book format. Well, I think first and foremost, it, it comes down to um, what's interesting. Um, I mean, not only what's interesting for an audience or a reader, certainly, but what's interesting for uh, you know, the, the creator, the person making the thing, you know, the person designing the thing. And so that's a really, I think in some ways, a really practical, straightforward way of looking at it. What do I want to be spending my time doing? What are you motivated to do? Obviously, writing a book or creating a monograph is going to take up a year of your time, probably at least. So what is the creative's pursuit there, you know? And I just didn't see any creative pursuit with a memoir. It just seems like much more of a cataloging and, and it was just less interesting to me. Plus, the, how many memoirs or, or how many design, graphic design memoirs are out there, which is sort of surprising to me. But so that gets back to the idea of what's interesting. Um, and again, I think there's two ways of looking at it from the maker and the, and the, and the audience or the reader. The, there's such a misunderstanding about what a graphic designer is and why we do, we've committed to do this thing that we do, you know? And so that, that's, um, that's, a, that's, I think, a basic human impulse to want to be understood to some degree, right? And uh, so I think the memoir for me was a way to, to share this obsession that I've had for a good chunk of my life now and what's amazing about it, you know, and maybe how someone comes to it, you know, uh, and I, and I, and I felt like, you know, the, the fun, the, the, one of the difficult things about the memoir too, in terms of a publisher, and this went on, on for a number of years is to talk a publisher into, to a memoir that doesn't have any drug addiction in it. And it doesn't, have any, you know, I mean, it's like, all right, is this an interesting life? You know, um, I don't know. It, it has been interesting for me, but there, there's no murders going on. There's no, uh, you know, and there's no plane crashes. There's no explosions. So I, I do think in a lot of ways, a, a story of a graphic designer is maybe kind of a boring, on the surface of it, sort of a boring, uh, not super exciting thing. And again, I think that is not the case. You know what I mean? It is exciting. I mean, every time we sit down to design something, it's life or death. You know, it's your complete attention. It's 
there's something always riding on it if you're doing it well, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I do think uh, getting back to the, the original idea, I do think for me anyway, I like when things are hard, you know, that motivates me, you know, putting myself in a position where I really don't know, because if you think about it, I mean, I, I teach design, so I'm continually trying to remind my students of this. You know, as designers, we're always so uncomfortable with the process of design, I feel like most of us, myself included. So it ends up being a mantra of saying, look, if you're totally lost and you don't know where this thing is going, that's a good thing. Because that's what design is, right? It's a process of finding something out. We don't sit down and go, oh, I know exactly what this thing needs to be. You know, the thrill of it, the excitement of it, the, the reason to do it is because you don't know. We tend to look at design from a pre-perspective. It has yet to be designed. It will act in the future. Despite this, there's a quality we can find in many graphic design objects that is related to a very large capacity to create memories through images. We can see this, for example, in an analysis of the Atelier Populaire posters designed and printed during the May 68 student riots in Paris. Or also in the way sanitation workers took on the rawness of red typography on white background, saying, I am a man, during the 1968 strikes in Memphis. Thinking of Dame Journal, I wanted to know how Alice Candua, as an editor, looks at this quality of graphic design. Yeah, I think actually I had a quite revelatory experience recently with an incredible publisher here in Copenhagen recently that I worked on a project with. And it was really mind opening to me because I realized that this person is first a publisher and their tool is actually graphic design. And I, I feel like sometimes, one, I think I, first of all, I should say I'm not a graphic designer. So, but I am, I, as a publisher and as somebody that works in editorial, I work with graphic designers all the time. But I think I'm, I'm very much interested in understanding, one, how to work better with graphic designers, because I think that a lot of the ways in which we work with graphic designers is like, they are here to execute other people's ideas. And I think that that is just like, flawed in my honest opinion and I think there's a lot of room for how we can actually like create better relationships around design projects that involve a graphic design element um but I really like seeing it as like yeah it was a tool to you know it's a tool as a publisher to communicate a variety of ideas and I think that sometimes maybe that part of graphic design kind of gets lost as it's like a part of the like a larger design toolkit in my honest opinion, but I think in terms of like graphic design and its relationship to Deem, I think what's really awesome about the designers that we work with and the creative team, because they, they really kind of head this up, is that Deem is, has a lot of really rich long form content. And I think what's really awesome about the publication is that it's meant, you know, you don't need to read, it's not a linear narrative, it's non-linear in a way. And so you can literally kind of jump around and hold a moment with different stories without needing to read it cover to cover. And I think the design really is highlights that and enhances that by kind of like giving both structure, but then leaving like a little bit of space um, and like adding like kind of like these playful, brighter kind of colors and of pop to like kind of make it not really to evoke feelings of like, I can be playful, I can be experimental, but I'm also seeking inspiration and I don't need to like be so committed to reading this back and forth to the cover to cover, but then also that I can like, it's engaging enough for people to also want to be present with the material. Pulsar's relation with the band They Might Be Giants dates back to the 80s. By that time, he was a big fan of their music. Far from imagining the future relation he would establish with them, almost like an official designer of the band. In 2011, Saar designed an amazing album cover for the band's album, Join Us. Questioning the importance of visual references in our work as designers, I invited Paul to go through this design and the unquestionable influence of the Velvet Underground's famous banana cover by Andy Warhol. 
Yeah. I mean, in that particular situation, that was something I became aware of after that project was done. The influence or the straight up parody of it. I mean, it's so close, right? Um, and it's not like I have that album sitting in my studio here or something. It's not like it's in the front of my head every single day. But you could definitely see I was sort of channeling some of that to some degree. You know, whether that's a good thing again or a bad thing, I don't know. I personally do not like parody. I have dabbled with it for various reasons over the years, you know, um, aping of something for a particular reason. Um, but uh, because I think it's a, again, I feel like it's a crutch to some degree. Um, but I do think like in that particular case, um, you know, I always feel like, I don't know if it's such a good thing not to be aware of that to some degree, uh, why you're making. Um, again, because I, I feel like, you know, repeating, it's rarely a good idea. Um, now, here's another thing I would say about that. If I hadn't brought that up, you know, this is a question to you, but no one else has ever said, oh my God, it looks just like that Andy Warhol uh, Velvet Underground cover, you know? So maybe, it, maybe it's okay. Maybe, it, maybe it's, it's just something lodged in there, uh, in here, um, that can come out and it's close. It's 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 close enough to be influenced and not close enough to be questionable, you know. But and again, I I don't know if I don't know if that's answering the question. But certainly, as graphic designers, I mean, I think this is an obvious thing too, right? If we're we we cobble together things that already have meaning, you know. Memory is a practice of care. Looking at specific design groups, or even at how publicity has been using the word design, we get a feeling of amnesia. Alice Grandois goes through this idea of design rejecting memory. Yes, I mean, I don't think there's a tendency. It's a very, it's very, it's like, it's something that ha happens across multiple, like, areas and arenas of design and other fields as well, like, a lot, you know, I mean, a lot of what we talked about in the last issue of DEEM is like thinking about our educational spaces, like a lot of the books that, you know, in my foundational years of learning erased so much history. It was very much centered around like very small bite-sized things or, or moments in U.S. history. And if you don't actually take the initiative to start to gather your own context, you realize you've been living your life with like a slice of history that has been, you know, uh, written with a certain intention. And I think that's definitely the case in design. And, and, and again, there literally is just like a, like a design amnesia around the fact that like people have been designing since the beginning of human existence and these like weird canons that have been, um, that have, that have been no, 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 like people that have actually designed design canons to basically like limit people's ways of thinking or actually just really kind of, um, again, reject memory, reject history, like literally like kind of they are um, engineering history in a way. And I think that in my perspective, I think that memory is a care-based practice. I think it's very much around, it's, it's and it's again, another through line in all of the practices. And I would say I can move into DEEM actually in this question and think a lot about how DEEM in, in a way is sort of a, a reparative gesture when we think about um design history for us i think it's very much like i would we would love to make sure that people if they are in both in the now but in the present wanting to look back and see what designers were thinking or how design was showing up in community contexts that they could actually see themselves in these stories and so i do think that like publishing is an, a practice of care i think that uh, you know, cooking, gardening, chefs, there's a lot of people that are like working to uncover and share narratives around the work that they've been doing again, because media, canons, institutions have just been so exclusive for so long. Um, and I think that we all kind of have a responsibility, if I'm being honest, to make sure that if we have certain tools that allow us to kind of really create memory or preserve practices or preserve um, lived experience, that we should really be kind of tapping into that, to be quite honest. Looking at colonial or post-colonial realities, 
we start to understand how important food was on the preservation and assertion of cultural heritage. Focusing on her work, Alice Grandois shares an example where food assumes an important role on the preservation of cultural heritage and also identity. Yeah, I think I will use an example that I'm working on because those are the things that I, I know the best. Um, but I think in terms of thinking about the relationship with food, you know, it's it really being this tool for, for cultural preservation and really also a tool to explore identity. I think that's a big part of what my collaborator Sybil and I do with Earthseed Provisions, but most specifically with like a subset of that, which is a project called Kayona. Uh, Kayona is actually named after the Taino chief, um, Ana Kayona on the island of Hispaniola, um, pre-Columbus. And a lot of the work that we do in that kind of with, under that moniker is really around our identity as first generation uh, hyphenates. We are both Haitian Americans and um, our families immigrated to New York actually from Haiti. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of our kind of coming of age, I think in our 20s, you know, her and I meeting and realizing that we had this shared cultural heritage and also wanted to continue to explore it because it's something we're really proud of. And this had this manifested in many ways. I mean, we've taken some trips to Haiti, some research trips to Haiti, um, thought about actually trying to like do something like have us like a, a project out there. But I think we realized that it was a little bit hard for us to maintain if we couldn't move there. Um, but beyond that, I think a lot of what we're working on is really more food specific. I think actually after coming back from some of those trips, we realized that food could really be an anchor for this type of cultural preservation. And we think a lot about how we're working on a cookbook essentially. And the cookbook is focused on archiving and preserving the historical and like important traditions of Haitian cuisine. Um, in a way, we're kind of also seeing it as like a cartography of the African diaspora by really getting an understanding of like Haitian, Haitian cuisine. And we really thought that like, it was quite bizarre to us that, you know, as we're moving through these generations, there's like a lot of these undocumented rituals, traditions, and, and how they might actually be lost because they haven't been preserved or archived really. And in a way we've just been really like, I think, I think move, I think equal parts disappointed, but equal parts moved at the fact that there's like very few resources that provide both like historical and contemporary context on the food. And it's such a historically rich nation. Um, but again, by design, literally has just been under documented. I mean, it's to find things about Haiti that really kind of transcend the narrative, this Western narrative of how they are the poorest, you know, uh, nation in the Western hemisphere and all the other kind of mindless colonialist um, associations that come with, with, come along with when people mention the, the country, it was just very infuriating for us. And so in this cookbook, we're actually kind of asking ourselves some questions. So we're thinking a lot about like, what does it mean to make memory? Um, we're thinking a lot about like, how is archiving an act of cultural preservation? And actually, how is it an act of resistance, both in an historic context and in its current iteration? Um, and we've been thinking about that a lot. I think there is this like, you know, I think there's a lot of us that want to hold space for things to be like precious and to be documented. And I think that food really becomes this space of like embodied memory. And in a way it helps us to kind of start to transcend space and really like the limits of like the individual body. So we can kind of like move from like both individual and collective experiences. And we've just been thinking a lot about how the center becomes like a space or really a center for women's memory in a collective way, like all of the cooking, the, the you know, the handling of food, um, the stories, the, the rituals, the celebrations that come along with each one of those things are so rich. And it just felt, it feels very important for us to be able to document those and, to, and for us to be able to pass them down to other traditions and to other generations. But not only just that, like also to be able to share it with others. I think there's just like this point of connectivity that is a through line in all of the practices that I am currently engaged in. And I think that there's just so much for us to learn. We can actually start to uncover a lot more about ourselves. Design process has a tangible connection with codes and meanings. These codes are only possible insofar as they carry the memory. It is precisely for this reason that we are in a time when we need to question the big part of these same meanings 
how and where we are using them. We're going to listen to Paul Sarr speaking of how he is looking at this transformative process also from a designer perspective. Also as a white male in America, I need to be in a listening mode. Uh, I need to shut my mouth and, and listen. Cancel culture is a way of describing something that is, I think, inherently negative, the way it's that that term, I think it's an obvious net positive. I think there's a lot of things that you can question about it, certainly. But, and again, I'm coming from an American perspective, very specific perspective. And I just talked about listening and not talking. But I do think that it's, it's such a good thing, at least for our society in general. Um, and I'll, I'll give you one example of how it has affected me in this really small way that I think points out what I'm talking about. I do a lot of illustration too, and a lot of them are pretty quick. And sometimes it's great to have a hand in there for one reason or another. Like you could go through my, I don't know how much, I don't have that much on my website that I've done over time, but hands, I've always used my hands. I, my hands have always photographed well, and they're sort of, they've always sort of just been a generic hand. Like it's a male white hand. And I never really thought about it as a whale, male white hand. It was just a hand. It's just a generic hand. But now I've had to think about it like, should it be a male white hand holding this thing? Now there's a practical reason it was a whale, male white hand. There's, I'm getting paid $300 for an illustration and I just wanted it to be a hand. I didn't want it to be a male white hand. I just wanted it to be a hand. And if it was a female hand or if it was a, a dark skinned hand ten, five or 10 years ago, you'd be saying something with that. Where this hand, it's invisible, it's just a hand. The fact that now I have to think about that, even if it's a pain in the ass, I think is so healthy, is so good. I mean, it really, that's kind of amazing. Like a hand should just be a hand. And, you know, and again, I think this is just a little thing, but if, if this whole thing gets us able, more able to, to see the other side, whatever that other side is, I think it's not a negative. I think it's a positive. So and I, I also feel like a lot of this is sort of has to come up and be sort of over the top. You know, like the Black Lives Matter thing here. Like my mom lives in upstate New York and she said things to me like, all lives matter. It's like, no, mom, you don't get it. You don't get it. Black lives matter doesn't mean black lives only matter. It means black lives matter too. That's what it means. It doesn't mean white lives don't, don't matter. And it needs to be said, you know? And so it's all great. It's all good. It's just all good. And it's a moment of time. And hope, I'm hopeful that, you know, in 10 years, we, they, we, there won't need to be a Black Lives Matter movement, you know? So anyway, that's my take. I'm going to go back to listening and not talking about it. We are what we do, especially what we do to change what we are. Wrote Eduardo Galeano on his book Voices of Time. I really like the intrinsic ability that design has to create memories. It lives on memories, but also builds them. There's an engagement, but at the same time, an enormous power that we must nurture as capable memory-making agents. This was the fifth episode of the Voices from the Atelier podcast, a podcast from the 2021 Porto Design Biennale. In the next episode, we will address Dream. See you next week. I would like to thank Pedro Geraldes, who made the music for this podcast. A big thank you to Alistair Fouad-Luke, 
Magda Seifert, Raquel Pais, Rui Caldas, and the Porto Design Biennale team. And finally, I want to thank my wonderful guests, Paul Sarr and Alice Grandois, for their precious time. I think the memory thing relates to graph design in this really interesting way. You know, I think, you know, you were talking about truth too, in, in terms of what we do. I think that's a huge topic as well, right? But if you think about um, how do you tell the truth as a graphic designer? Um, I don't think many graphic designers are thinking that way. I know I certainly do, but you want to, if, if, if you are going to lean on something, you should know what you're leaning on. And you should try your best to be true to where that thing came from and its relationship to what you're doing with it, you know? But, but again, I would, I would say in a way, you could almost say that the only way that anyone can understand something a graphic designer makes is, is somewhat due to memory, right? Because forms have meaning and how much of that, that meaning is inherent in the thing or is because how it has been used over time, you know? Uh, you can take typeface for any typeface, for example, you know, I'm thinking of, of the, you know, the emigre uh, bitmap typefaces in the 80s. I remember looking at that stuff and I felt a really strong disconnect from the way that the designer, I think it was Susanna Litko, would talk about the typeface and what most people would actually take away from it. Like for her, it wasn't about technology. It was that it, she was creating new forms that didn't have any baggage, right? I mean, that's that, that's sort of the in, that that's sort of the basic concept behind Helvetica to begin with, right? We we're going to design a typeface that has no baggage. Mm -hmm.